Hello, everybody. It's great to see three-dimensional people in space for a community-building event. Give yourselves a round of applause for showing up. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Christopher. I'm the executive director of Vermont Humanities, and we're really delighted to be here in 118 Elliott um, in Brattleboro to kick off Vermont Reads 2022, El Viaje Mas Caro, The Most Costly Journey. Um, at Vermont Humanities, we connect with people across Vermont to create just, vibrant, and resilient communities and to inspire a lifelong love of learning. Uh, Vermont Reads is one of our signature programs, and The Most Costly Journey is actually the 20th book in the series and the first truly bilingual uh, book that we are doing in this program. So 20 years in, um, we're delighted to be with this group of people um, to spend a year working on, this, on understanding the stories of migrant farm workers around Vermont um, as, as we, um, we get to meet people across the state. Folks sign up for Vermont Reads programs through our website. There's a very short application. If you want to do that, you're welcome to organize something. Um, we ask that it not simply be a reading group or a reading program, but that it involves some other additional learning activity or service activity involved um, with the themes of the book, including, of course, migration and housing um, and being in a new place, um, all of the different things that you'll learn about tonight. Um, I want to offer a few thanks before we get going, um, particularly to Heidi Sulis from the Open Door Clinic, who is here with us tonight in the audience. Thank you for being here, Heidi. You'll learn more about the role of the Open Door Clinic as we go. Um, we also want to thank the Vermont Folklife Center, um, Andy Kolovos, uh, Merrick Bennett's Comics Workshop. Merrick is with us here as well. Julia Doucette. Um, also with the Open Door Clinic, uh, and then some of the other partners that have been involved with creating this book, the UVM Department of Anthropology, UVM Extension's Bridges to Health Program, the UVM Humanities Center, and the Vermont Community Foundation uh, for their work in creating El Viaje Mas Caro, The Most Costly Journey. Um, we'd also like to offer special thanks to our Vermont Reed sponsors, Jan Blumstrom and the Jack and Dorothy Byrne Foundation. We rely on their support year after year to do these programs, um, and we're delighted that they've continued with us this year. Um, again, thank you to 118 Elliott and Wyndham World Affairs. Um, thank you very much to BCTV for doing the live stream. Hello to everybody who is watching online. Um, and um, this evening, we're going to... Um, really just have a conversation uh, with, with Merrick and Andy and Julia. Um, and we're gonna start it off with Andy telling us a little bit about the art that you see on the walls. Thank you, Christopher. Hello, everybody. So as a part of helping support Vermont Reads, we thought it might be a good idea to pull together some um, materials that we've created over the years about migrant workers. Um, all the projects you see around here have been partnership projects in various ways. This exhibit in toto is called The Most Costly Journey, after the book, because we couldn't come up with a better title, um, and consists of four different components. Uh, the first one is the one you see immediately behind us, The Golden Cage, which was a photo and audio project put together by Chris Urban and a photographer named Caleb Kenna back in 2007. Uh, Chris worked for Migrant Education as an English language educator. He's currently a Spanish teacher uh, at Harwood. Um, and he became, he worked a lot with these guys and men and women became really engaged with their lives, made friends and thought, you know, nobody knows they're here. He encountered Caleb who was taking pictures and they teamed up and then came to talk to us and we worked with them to create this exhibit through that process. Uh, the other component, and there's only one element of it here, but if you look on that wall with the paintings, there's a diorama. Um, an artist uh, from Rutland County named B. Amore worked with some colleagues, including uh, Susanna McCandless, who is a geographer, um, to provide art supplies to a group of workers who are interested in working with them to create dioramas representing their journeys broadly. So in some cases, it's literal border crossings. In other cases, it's more metaphorical. Um, El Viaje Mascaro is on that wall, and El Viaje Mascaro is Spanish for the most costly journey. And um, that's what we called the project as we were working on it. So for this, in this case, we pulled four comics from them and printed them large just so people can read them on the wall like, well, like art. And the final component, um, one of the participants in the project uh, who is represented in Algo, 
Algo Adentro, uh, El Emigrante, is also a painter. Uh, so we, when the Folk Life Center had a sales gallery at our building, we used to sell his paintings there. So I reached out to Julia and said, hey, do you think El Emigrante might like to have some of his work shown? So we pulled, it all, we pulled a selection together with him, and that's what's on the wall. Uh, and the one diorama there is the one that was created by El Emigrante too. So uh, we invite you, will there be time afterwards for people to check stuff out? Yeah, check stuff out. The final thing I'll say about the exhibit is that El Emigrante does sell his paintings. The money he makes goes to help support his uh, family's education, going into grandchildren now, I think, based on the description. If you're interested in purchasing one, the prices are pretty modest, quite honestly. There's a list at the front. Um, one of them has been sold, but take a look, look around. If you want, get a hold of me, and um, we'll work something out. So thank you very much, and thank you again, Christopher. Thanks, Andy. I'm going to be passing it back down the line now, and I'm going to ask each of you if you could to briefly introduce your role in the project and your organization, if you have one, and, and how this really got started. Um, so we're going to start at this end with Merrick and, um, and head our way back down and we'll get Andy to tell us a little bit more about the Folk Life Center specifically as well. All right, I think we'll go back in time because I'm probably the last of the three of us to join the project. So um, I joined the project in, my name is Merrick. I'm a cartoonist and musician from New Hampshire. Can I tell them I'm from it's New okay. Hampshire? All right. <laughs> And um, I, I guess I'm sort of part-time Vermonter when I come over and do comics here. I do a lot of comics here. It's a good, good state to draw in. Um, and I think around 2014, 2015, around that time, uh, I, was, I had just gotten back and completed a graphic novel about my family history and regional history in Eastern Europe. And I had realized I've lived in New Hampshire all my life. And I don't know so many things about the history of the state. So I'm going to find out the secret stories that nobody knows. And of course, I went to the town histories and started drawing stories from those. And when I came across, when Andy introduced me to this project that you two were putting together, I realized there were whole dimensions of history and the present in New England that I was unaware of growing up and living here all my life. Um, and, and it kind of blew my mind and I got really interested in working with the storytellers in the El Viaje project and learning something of their lives, my neighbors here in New England. Um, and so it's been a, a really exciting experience for me as an artist and as just a citizen of this region. Um, so I'll move over to Andy here. Thanks, Merrick. Hi, so I'm Andy Kolovis. I'm the archivist and associate director of the Vermont Folk Life Center. Um, Vermont Folk Life Center has, uh, is, a, is a statewide organization with offices in Middlebury. I'm going to attempt to read our new mission off this piece of paper, uh, if I can read my own handwriting. Julie's going to make it harder. Uh, <laughs> the Vermont Folk Life Center seeks to deepen our understanding of each other by engaging with communities across Vermont to document and share expressions of tradition, innovation, and culture. Um, I am a folklorist. Um, I am an ethnographer, uh, sort of my wife might say like a cheap anthropologist. Um, and uh, I got involved in the project through a colleague of ours, Teresa Mayers, who's one of the co-editors, who knew I was interested both uh, in comics, I'm a lifelong comic nerd, uh, and also applying, using comics as a way to tell ethnographic stories. Um, so that was really what drew me in. Um, I want to say hello to our executive director, Kate Hoy of the Vermont Folk Life Center, and I believe our board chair, uh, Leslie Turpin, is here as well. Uh, so thank you both for coming. So should I give Julia the mic now? Pass it on down. Pass it. Do you want it? <laughs> OK, here you go. Thank you, Andy. Uh, my name is Julia Doucette, and I am a nurse case manager at the Open Door Clinic in Middlebury. And we're a free health clinic for people without insurance. About half of the patients we see are these immigrant farm workers um, that led to this project. Um, this project really started back a long time ago in 2014 when we at the clinic started seeing a lot of illness in a lot of our patients that we could not um, explained through any sort of medical test. So we had people with headaches and stomach aches and we would run tests and we would throw medicine at it and we would take all these histories of people and there would be no physical ailments that we could come across. And um, 
in our ridiculously obtuse way, <laughs> it came to us that these were manifestations of some of the psychosocial um, struggles that our patients were facing both from their home countries through their journey to us and then living isolated lives in um, a country that doesn't speak their language or share their culture. So we realized in this mental health um, struggles that our patients were having, and I don't know if I should admit this very early on at the beginning of the talk, but I don't like comics. I don't appreciate <laughs> comics. <laughs> but as so many of us do, I had a um, I had one of those driveway moments that now Vermont Public says in their, in their drive, you know, you, you, you pull up somewhere, you sit, but you're listening and you're so engaged you can't turn off the radio. And in that moment, in thinking about the struggles of our patients and their mental health struggles, I heard that driveway moment where someone came on and they were talking about um, Vermont, the... Uh, Vermont Center for Cartoon Studies, which happens to be in White River Junction. And it all of a sudden came to me that comics and health um, are actually and can be very intimately entwined. And I'm realizing that I'm actually bleeding over to the next question. So I'm going to pass this back to Christopher. And of course, the next question is, Julia, <laughs> tell us about how you got interested in comics <laughs> as a public health tool. So I'm going to pass it back. Well, Christopher, thanks for asking. <laughs> so, so let's rewind back to these, um, the mental health challenges that we were seeing. And we in the clinic had conversations of, over conversations about how are we going to address these unmet needs. And in looking at our population, which is primarily from southern Mexico and um, northern Central America, primarily Spanish speaking, some um, indigenous speakers, very, um, very impoverished areas that these folks are coming from. They're not city dwellers. Um, and they're, they're not surrounded by a lot of the more kind of American Western medicine trappings. And so it became very obvious really quickly that traditional mental health counseling would not be a culturally um, familiar way of addressing the issues. And finding Spanish speaking uh, clinicians would also be increasingly difficult. And so I went and met with a woman who was the director of counseling at Middlebury College, who happened to be of um, Mexican-American descent. And she was talking about the power in stories and the power that stories hold. And so it was then in pondering the power of stories that I was happening to be sitting in my car and having the Vermont public moment. Um, and so realizing that graphic novels, graphic um, stories are very much a culturally familiar thing. There are a lot of um, comics, comic stories, books that are sold in markets in southern Mexico that, that tell stories. Some have lessons in them, and some are just stories. And so realizing that comics is something that's easily accessible um, in my lack of appreciation for comics, also understanding that for a population that 30% has less than a sixth grade level of education, that comics can tell a really big story with very few words. And so we got connected to, thankfully, someone like Andy, the comic nerd, um, to help us take that story and bring stories into art. <laughs> Thanks, and good transition. Uh, I'm going to go over to Andy next. And Andy, I I'm wondering if uh, you know you really bring the the academic viewpoint, the cheap anthropology viewpoint to it. No, you're you're much more talented than that. And I'm I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about the the ethical component of collecting these stories, and and how did you think about um, the ethics of this? 
Well, the work we do at the Folk Life Center is it's so funny because I'm answering your question, but I'm talking to you folks. Um, the, uh, our work, as I said, is rooted in ethnography as a practice. To boil that down, um, the way we usually say it is that when we interview people, when we spend time with them, what we're trying to do is understand how they see the world from their own perspective. And then when we create exhibits, we work with them to try to realize how they see themselves so that other people can recognize them. Um, so that collaborative back and forth is really is central to what we do. So often I say that our method and our ethics are kind of impossible to separate. You know, so going into this as a collaborative ethnographic project, um, we, and Teresa is also someone, Teresa Mares is an anthropologist at UVM, think about um, potential risk to participants, and in this case, there was a lot of risk. You know, most of these folks are undocumented, well, all of them are undocumented, I guess, right? Uh, there's a risk of deportation. They themselves are at risk in their work environments. So how do, we, how do we do things that don't potentially cause them more risk, that don't potentially bring harm to them? And, you know, so that as an example, and telling these stories, all of these, all the names are anonymized. These aren't these people's real names. Um, one of the wonderful things about using comics to tell these sorts of stories, um, with a photograph, you'll pretty much be able to recognize who the person is. With a drawing, I would argue, you can capture an essence of that person without necessarily revealing who they are. So you can create this sort of humanistic kind of anonym, a visual humanistic anonymization, um, not, not to wax too academic-y, but um, that can really, I believe, build a connection between the reader and, and the story, and the storyteller. So that was another key approach. Also, all the farmscapes are basically genericized. You know, um, for folks who are familiar with agriculture in Vermont, they're usually fairly industrial. Um, for others, there's some romanticized images of farming. But um, the other ethical component was, we started with the assumption that these aren't our stories, that the stories belong to the storytellers. So that the way these things would be represented necessitated them having input in how the stories were being told. And that was really the collaborative component. Um, and one of the things we worked out was how this collaborative process could unfold with comics. Is this answering the question the way you wanted me to? Good, okay. <laughs> I was like, am I talking about something Christopher cares about? Um, uh, I'm here for you, man. Um, can, I, can I jump in? Because I realize um, one of the things we didn't say, which people who have not actually experienced the book may not know, is that the stories that we collected were initially collected for a mental health outreach program. So they were collected in Spanish, they were translated into English, they were drawn, and then they were put back into Spanish so that we could hand them out at targeted outreach visits with our patients to open up conversations about mental health and kind of take a backdoor approach to be able to share someone's story with someone else. Thank you, Julia. Mm -hmm. And the process by which we went from transcript to comic um, would vary depending on the individual who was the storyteller and the individual who was the cartoonist. Merrick, for instance, speaks Spanish and was within the region. So when he worked on Algo Adentro with uh, El Emigrante, you were in touch with each other, right? So like that, that comic was built with them going back and forth from the start. And on a spectrum, that represents kind of one extreme of the approach we used. At the other end, there's the cartoonist who doesn't speak any Spanish, who was given a translated transcript um, that was pre-selected by the clinical team to highlight the things that they felt were clinically important. That's one of the things, like, we can't stress enough that we, weren't, we were viewing this as a health outreach project. And there were times where at least I felt like we were getting a little ahead of ourselves, or I was getting ahead of myself. And, always going back to that point was really important. We're not doing this to make comics because it's cool to make comics. We're doing this to make comics to serve a purpose. And you know, I would actually, that was, I'd go back to that a bunch. Um, so they would then get this transcript, illustrate it, come back to Julia, who, you, and would share it back to the storyteller. And the storyteller would give commentary on what they liked or disliked, or if it was fine, or you know, make me look this way. And then the artist would then finalize it, and then the book would be created. So that's sort of that's that collaborative approach. And this is what I mean to say that it's hard for us to separate the issue of ethics from method; that they're kind of the same thing. 
Thanks, and we'll, we'll take this over to Merrick now, actually, and, and have you talk a little bit more about the, the process of turning this into an actual comic. Um, when you're adapting somebody's true story, what do you think about as an artist, as a comic artist? What's important to you when you're thinking about adapting those stories? How do you structure a recording of an interview in order to make a compelling piece of art? Well, first of all, I, I do want to say I'm I'm immensely grateful to being able to for being able to work with Julia and Andy and our other project participants because um, this would be a daunting, impossible project to do as a lone artist or as just a group of artists reaching out and trying to do this project. Um, so, so really, at all levels, every level is essential. At the artist level. Um, I do a lot of work in uh, autobiography, just doing a little diary comic every day or so, you know, of something that happens. I do a lot of work with primary historical sources, primary texts and images. Um, so I really enjoy having somebody else's story that can guide me through the imaginative process of saying, what would this look like interpreted onto a page or eight pages or 20 some pages? Um, and I love that process of going back and forth between a source text and the artwork and trying to get the two. They're not the same thing. They're not even, they're totally different works of art, but getting them sort of in parallel, aligning them. Um, and I really appreciate in this project the fact that the storyteller is alive and is, as part of the project, is going to respond to the artwork and basically give it a thumbs up or thumbs down, but also make some comments and requests. Um, that's something when you work with old, old historical texts, you don't get that chance <laughs> with your storytellers. Um, so for this, uh, the first thing that comes to mind in answer to the question, how do you work with somebody else's story? I feel like I have two competing impulses. The one is to um, stick to the story. For instance, the first transcript I got uh, for this project was Jose's story. And Jose tells the story of how he came to be, how he crossed the border. And when he starts out, it, it, it runs something like, um, it's one of the early stories in the book. He basically says, it all started the day I crossed the border into the United States. And I've been here for 10 years now. And I was born in Mexico and I grew up there. And when you cross the border, you have to do this. Oh, I was in New York before, before I came to Vermont. And when I met, I actually, yeah, I got out a map and I plotted those points of the story. And I'm thinking, it's all out of order by time. It's all out of order by space. This is just all out of order. Maybe I should put it into order, like chronologically or geographically. But the impulse of stick to the text tells me, no, this storyteller is listing these things in this order for a narrative reason. So how do I respect those choices and, and not say, no, 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 let me tell you how to tell your own story. Right, um, So I try to stick to the text like that and figure out how does that work. The other impulse is it has to be understandable when any one of us picks up this book. The artwork has to kind of invite you in and say, hey, take a look at this page. Hey, maybe take a look at the next panel. Maybe take a look at the next panel. And now you really want to turn the page, don't you? I mean, it's an interaction not just with the storyteller and the artist, but with the two of us and with the readers who are going to come to this. Um, so, so the impulse is there also to take that into account and try, and, and I love the tension created by those. I, they're not competing impulses, they're just going in different directions. And, that's, and things that go in different direc directions create tension and all harmony comes from tension, right? And so, so there's, like, there's this, this nice struggle going on between all the competing um, elements of that. And we could get more specific if you want, but those are the first two impulses that come to mind. Thank you so much. Uh, Julia, I want to go back to you and uh, just check in on, on you know, the, what was the initial reaction when the comics went back to the workers? But also I'm interested in the reaction of the farmers, the farm owners. Um, how did they respond to this as well uh, when they started seeing the comics show up um, on their farms. So originally when we started the project, we were thinking that the power in those stories would be used 
to share with other people so that people wouldn't be feeling so alone. They would know they're not the only ones who drink out of loneliness or the, they're not the only ones who miss their family. And we really thought that it would be in the reception of those stories that would really help people the most. And we were wrong. Um, some of the most powerful reactions were from the storytellers themselves. And I think that speaks to the power of being able to share your story with someone, have somebody listen, and have someone reinforce the fact that what you are saying is important. And in thinking about reactions, there's one story in here, and it's a woman's very personal journey through um, a domestic abuse situation. And she was a little hesitant about telling her story in the first place. She didn't want people to recognize who she was. And as we talked more, she realized that the value in her story is that she was able to share it because she was able to go through it and come out the other side. And so she decided that she would share it in hopes of helping other women. So we put together the story, we put together her booklet, it was in the cartoon form, and we showed it to her for the first time. And she took it and shared it with her family back home and her family here. And she said, the most powerful thing was being able to take a story, see herself in it, and realize that she could see it as somebody outside of herself. And so she was able to feel a compassion for the person in the story that she hadn't been able to feel for her. And so I think that's the most poignant example of the reaction of the stories. Um, a lot of people said that being able to talk about the unspeakable were, allowed them to let go of those feelings and to be able to move on. Um, one of the other happiest moments in the project for me was when the stories were lying around the house of a farm worker and their daughter picked up the stories and started reading them and read through each one, got to the end and said, are there any more like this? <laughs> and so knowing that not only does it speak to the person who's telling the story and the people who are receiving the story, but also the kids who are understanding perhaps the lives of their parents and their um, family members a little bit better. So the second part is how do farmers react? And to be totally honest, it's only now that this is out in an English speaking book that a lot of them are even aware that the stories existed because again, they were in individual Spanish booklets um, that were handed directly to patients. So besides the one farmer who was a part of one of the stories, um, the farmers are actually just discovering that these stories exist right now. I'd love to hear more about that at, at some point. If you, have, if, if you have stories about that, right? Maybe that's part of the, the, the last question, the closing up. Great. Uh, and and, and this, this relates. Andy, why did you decide to translate the stories into English? This was originally a Spanish-only project. What, what prompted the shift? Well, there's partly the selfish reason that I don't speak or read Spanish. Um, so I wanted to be able to enjoy them. Uh, you know, uh, the main reason we did it was as to create awareness among English-speaking neighbors that these people were here that they had needs, and that these were some of the challenges they were facing. So we saw it primarily as an awareness building tool um, for, for uh, other Vermonters, you know, to, to make connections and to humanize the population toward them. Um, and to go back to what I said earlier, that was one of those points where we're like, ooh, this is really cool. Oh wait, we're not doing this for an English speaking audience. We're doing this for a Spanish-speaking audience and a particular Spanish-speaking audience. So we, that was that revisiting that point. Um, the reason we did the English book first, and I'll let you guys also chime in because my memory is pretty flawed, was um, to build awareness to do the Spanish book, <laughs> you know, to, uh, to put it out into the world, to create some noise about its existence. And then we're going to be kickstarting a Spanish language version on the coattails of the Vermont Reads program um, in the next couple months. So does that get at what you were after, Christopher? Sure. Okay. Keep an eye out for that Kickstarter and contribute to the Spanish version. Uh, it'll certainly be available through Vermont Reads once it comes out. Uh, Merrick, you're pretty connected in the comics world. 
Um, and I, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how your colleagues responded to this project, other artists and, and other writers who are doing this kind of work or different, different kind of comics work. What, what was the reaction and has it inspired similar projects in other places? And I have my own story to tell about that too. Well, I'll ask you about it then. Yeah, um, I think, Julia, I think you've, you've been the most eloquent about the power of comics in this, this, uh, at this table so far, for a yeah, uh, detractor. No, that, what you said was so um, w really beautifully expressed how I feel about why I draw comics. It's so interesting to hear that reflected back from someone who doesn't draw comics, Guadalupe in the book, uh, but collaborates in the creation of a comic and then can recognize that. I hadn't quite expressed it that way or thought about it that way. It's taking an idea, a story that maybe we share, collaborating on it and putting it down in some digestible way so that visually we can look at all the parts together and understand something new about how they all fit together. Um, so I'm coming around the long way, I guess, to your question. Um, but I think that's the, that for me is the big picture as an artist about what I really appreciate about this work is that it's not, it's not just me sitting at a desk working on a picture. It's me sitting at my desk working on a picture that reflects something somebody in another state, the next, the state next door, uh, has experienced and expressed and wants to see in a different form and it passes through my attention it goes back to them it kind of goes back and forth between us and through that process somehow we get closer to not their story because their story is the transcript or what they were trying to express not my story the all that i bring to the page but really our story it's, it knits us together in a, by going back and forth through the project that way um, so in terms of effects on other artists i guess i can only speak for myself but i I feel more connected through this project by having my artwork in this collection along with 15 other artists and uh, to see how different each piece of the book is. Uh, each chapter is done in a different style, done with a different set of backgrounds and beliefs about comics from the artist and a different storyteller. And I just love seeing the diversity of those voices. And I'm so glad that it's out there um, for, for other artists to look at and see that, that um, complexity and diversity. Um, I should note that this week is out in Chicago, I believe, is the Graphic Medicine International Conference, right? And, uh, and I guess I should also note that The Most Costly Journey is shortlisted for the uh, Graphic Medicine International Collective Prize. So um, fingers crossed, but also it's a great honor to be shortlisted there um, for the international award. And um, there are, and two projects that come to mind also in response to that, because they're sitting here in front of me. Um, Dr. Casey McKinney at Portland State University has inspired, uh, they said by El Viaje, they put together an entire zine about homelessness, um, drawn by many people who are experiencing homelessness in the Portland area. And, um, and so if anybody wants to check that out, I have my own copy from Dr. McKinney that, um, that we all got in the mail. So that, that's inspiring to see the ideas going out across the country and then coming back in different forms. They printed in color, ooh. Um, and I know also I want to mention um, Janet Beale's novel, graphic novel that just came out, Their Blood Got Mixed. It came in the mail and I sent her a note. I read the whole book. It's about the um, Kurdish, um, the Kurdish resistance in northeastern Syria. And, uh, and movement for self-government. And I sent her a note saying, oh, this is such an inspirational book. And she wrote back saying, well, I was partly inspired by <laughs> The Most Costly Journey. So, um, so it's really nice to see those ideas getting reflected. And then final thing I'll say, uh, I just had the great pleasure of working with Meg Mott on Constitution Comics Camp up in Putney a couple weeks ago. And the way that we drew, we were drawing Supreme Court case comics about the Fourth Amendment issues with teenagers. Um, and if you've never sat in a library room for a week with teenagers drawing Fourth Amendment comics, I highly recommend it. Um, and, and I wasn't so sure a few, few weeks ago, but it was so wonderful. But the way that we went about drawing those court cases, it, it, early on in the week we realized, oh, this is ethnography. This isn't just obscure, abstract legal reasoning. 
These are the stories of people's lives. If a case goes to the Supreme Court, it's because somebody has experienced something that is hugely life-changing for all of us, and it's being argued at the highest levels of government. For us to just draw these comics and draw these people's stories in the facts of the case without their input and involvement is kind of questionable, right? Would you be comfortable with a group of strange, unknown teenagers drawing your life story <laughs> 20 years from now? Maybe you would, but I, I've, after doing the most costly journey, we realized, oh, we have a responsibility to the privacy of these people's lives and to the, the integrity of their personal stories. And actually, paradoxically, we decided we would fictionalize the stories and t retell the stories in our own characters, uh, which happen to be kind of cute animal characters, to get at the meaning of the story without saying, I'm drawing Christopher's story here without asking Christopher to say whether it's accurate or not. Um, so I, so this model is like changing how, how I teach comics and how, so how my students are experiencing comics. And that's been really fun to see. You, you don't know where these things will lead. Thank you so much. Um, I had the opportunity to spend a, a week with uh, leaders from all over the country uh, a couple of weeks ago. And one of the people that I spent time with works uh, on public health in the inner city in Camden, New Jersey. Um, and as I talked a little bit about El Viaje Mas Caro, they got very excited about the, the opportunity to perhaps use comics to tell stories of people living in Camden. Um, and I think we're trying to arrange some sort of call in the next few weeks uh, with New Jersey Humanities um, and this, this public health organization in Camden um, to talk about how they might get started going down that road. So it's wonderful for me to see these echoes happen. And of, and of course, I promised that all three of you would work with them. And you know, you've, you, don't, you don't have anything to do, right? You can just go to Camden and, and help them out. Exactly. <laughs> you know, I've been thinking about this project for a while as ethical leadership. Um, in this process. Um, and I'm wondering if you can talk, each of you, just very briefly, a little bit about how this art or similar art is contributing to that national conversation um, about immigration and agriculture in Vermont um, and around the country. It's a big issue right now. Uh, there's a lot of pain happening across, across the country and indeed across the continent. Um, and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, this project in relation to that larger story. Um, should I pick who goes first? I'm just going to hand it to Merrick. <laughs> you got a scared look in your eyes. Huh? We'll go with what he said. <laughs> the, the first thing that comes to mind is I, like I said, when we started, I, I grew up in New Hampshire, grew up in New England, have lived here all my life. Uh, thought I knew the region really well, and then through this project came to find out oh, everything I believed about the mythical New England dairy farm was not the full story. And there are many, many more stories there to be, to be learned and, and many more voices to be part of this, this discussion. Um, I mean, I, I just, on the way here, I was remembering, what, 10 or 20 years ago, going through a real Woody Guthrie phase and, and singing uh, Deportees with my guitar, my out of tune, acoustic guitar, is this the best way we can grow our big orchards, you know? About deportees and uh, migrant labor picking the fruits in California in the 1930s. And I remember singing that song and singing it as, oh boy, something that we solved 80 years ago because Woody Guthrie wrote these great songs about these injustices. Come to find out these issues have been here longer than that and are still here. Um, and on the shorter term, Around 2018, 2017, 2018, we first started trying to put this book together. And there, there was such an urgency to, to get it out for the midterms in 2018, I think. And we, we of course, didn't make that deadline. And it, wasn't, it didn't come out till 2021. And each time I think the moment has come and we've missed the moment, it turns out migration, immigration, and, and these issues of justice and... and um, and visibility have just gotten more and more urgent. So um, now that the book's out, I'm glad at least this is another way to hear some of these voices. And um, 
and I and and it's starting to spur other ways for people to to bring these voices out and make them visible. Um, but we have a long ways to go, and this is just I think this is a first little baby step. But um, I really um, encourage you all to just go back and forth between the pictures and the comics, and then you'll you'll come up with ways to apply these models and these ideas in your own communities in ways that we'd never think of. So go for it. Try drawing a story with somebody else and see what happens. What Merrick said. I'll get that. The um I guess one thing for me is is, you know, you look at um the estimated size of the population that we're talking about and it's roughly what, twelve hundred people in the state? And you can say that even in a state as small as Vermont, how significant is that? But then you think about the work they're doing and the industry they're doing it in and how um, so tied to the Vermont identity, to the culture of Vermont, is this idea of the dairy farm, you know? That creating an awareness of the people who are actually sustaining it with their labor um, I, I think is crucial, and I think that's really for that secondary use, right? Not the primary use, just to go back to it, because I got to remind myself again, you know, was to serve workers' health care needs, mental health needs. But um, for the secondary use, like, I think there's a real value in it, you know? Um, the other thing, and this is speaking to something that Merrick talked about, is I'm always really excited, you know, when people say, what you did is really cool, we want to copy it. You know, I'm not like, Still, you know, it, it's, I'm thrilled because, you know, I want people to copy this. I want people to explore this kind of approach to storytelling, um, you know, where the authority is not the writer. The authority is not the artist. The authority is the person whose experience is being shared, you know. And to me, um, that's, that's revolutionary you know, as a way to, to bring people's words out. So I think that's really another, just a broadly important thing beyond just agriculture. Um, to add to the agriculture discussion, it's, you know, we also are at this real pivot point, again, in Vermont, where this uh, industry, this agricultural um, field that is so central to how we perceive ourselves is once again in crisis, with farms closing, with scale increasing, you know, and what does that mean? You know, and how are we going to reconcile ourselves to, to that down the road? And then what does it mean to this population? Because they're not vanishing. They're moving into other fields. You know, so anyway, now it's Julia's turn. Well, I'm going to change my answer a little bit because um, throughout the conversation, it, it keeps coming back to me. Whose stories are these and whose stories are they to tell? And I think in any conversation, there are certain voices. And I think that through this book, we are bringing these workers to the table. And we're bringing their voices into a conversation where they should be at the table. Um, they should be talking about their jobs and what it means to work in agriculture and what our immigration policy um, how that affects their lives. And I think that instead of listening to the conversation from up here on an academic or a policy level, I think listening to the voices of the people who are most intimately involved is a really important piece of the conversation. So um, I think it's bringing a personal face to the conversation and and invisible voices to the table. I just have to intercept. <laughs> and I, I totally support what you're all saying. I think what will be truly revolutionary is next time we do this discussion, if we could actually have the storytellers actually at the table with actual voices safely represented in the room, the people who put the food in the stores for all of us to consume, if they could come and tell us what their lives are like, that would be, that would be truly revolutionary. Then you're sitting at the table with revolutionaries. <laughs> coming soon. Um, we're actually coming in August, September. Er, early August. Early August. There actually will be a panel 
um, of farm workers that are going to be part of the conversation that will be um, answering questions or speaking about whatever they would like to speak to. So stay tuned. Thanks. If anybody has questions, please, I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but we need to capture the sound. So come on up to the mic if you would like to, to ask a question. We'd love to hear from members of the audience. Andy, you had mentioned this and I, when I was here and was seeing the uh, exhibits being put up. I asked when the golden cage, when the photos, which are extraordinary, uh, were taken. And I think it's 2007. Yeah, that's my memory. So it's quite a while. And there was also something, Julia, that when you and I were talking once, you said, um, you know, people are actually moving to labor other than farm labor for a variety of reasons, including the decline. Uh, in, in the dairy industry. And I'm just curious about some of the changes you've seen in the lives of the, of the farm workers or the migrant laborers um, since the book was made or maybe since the golden cage photos were taken. You know, are people doing work other than being on dairy farms now? I think there, there are two major trends that, that we've been seeing at the clinic since around that time. I started in 2011, so I can only speak till then. Um, the first is that our um, immigration policy changed and the border crossings, there was back in the maybe 2009, they decided that um, they would funnel the immigration through the most treacherous, the most harsh, and the, the longest possible border crossing. And so border crossings, um, became much more dangerous, much more expensive, and much more daunting. So we started seeing from patients who would come, stay maybe two or three years, go home for a year or so, come back again, stay another few years, um, to people who were coming up and spending eight, 10, 12 years at a time because it was too dangerous and too expensive to go home and come back. Um, the second is as agriculture has been changing and a lot of the smaller dairies have been closing, some of the dairies have been taking on robotic milkers, and so there's been a big shift across agriculture. And that's, like you said, has been shifting where these workers are finding work. Um, through the pandemic, there's been, or out, through and after the pandemic, there's been a huge need for low wage, um, super important work. So working in, in restaurants, in landscaping, in roofing, um, carpentry sorts of work. And so we've really started seeing workers going out into non-agricultural jobs, which um, generally are a lot fewer hours, a lot less stinky, um, more during the day hours, and just in, an easier lifestyle. I'm gonna ask a question now before I lose my nerve, but um, I'm from uh, Bellows Falls, Vermont, and I work at the Rockingham Library. And we're thinking about, um, we're applying for a Vermont Humanities Council grant to promote the most costly journey. And um, I, I'm trying to get a panel together for a panel discussion. And um, there's a woman who works at a local health clinic who um, is interested in becoming involved. They have worker, they had migrant farm workers come to their clinic. So she has some experience, one of them speaks Spanish, so that works out great for the workers. Um, but she was wondering if there are going to be any actual migrant farm workers on the panel. And I wasn't sure um, I know there was some mention of risk involved with that because some of them are maybe at risk of deportation um, and the risk of maybe the farmers not liking the idea of their employees um, talking about their con the life living conditions. But then I heard you're set, you said in August there's going to be a panel of farm workers. So I was wondering, and actually in our area of Vermont there are there aren't that many dairy farms, but we have migrant workers on vegetable farms in the area. So I was just wondering what your take is as far as me approaching or trying to find a farm worker 
that would feel safe enough to be on our panel. Thank you. Julia, do you want to take that? So the question is more about safety for um, public speaking for migrant farm workers to, to speak out. So I think, I think the first important distinction to make is um, that you can't assume that all migrant farm workers or immigrant farm workers are undocumented. Um, we do in the US have an H-2A visa, which is an agricultural visa. It's a seasonal visa that allows people to come into the US, work here legally for up to 10 months of the year, go home for two months. And so a lot of the vegetable pickers or a lot of the more seasonal jobs, um, blueberries, apples, and other, other seasonal crops are on an H-2A visa. Um, so they have social security numbers um, and there is no risk of, of anything to those folks. Dairy is not year round. I mean, it's not seasonal. The cows give milk year round. And so they're not eligible for any agricultural visa. There's no guest worker program or any other way that they can come. Um, they can't get a green card to work on a farm unless they're um, highly skilled veterinarians or um, animal breeders. So we don't ask um, documentation status, but we do estimate that about 98% of the patients that we see are undocumented. Undocumented, yep. But I also think that um, the most important thing is the individual person. And these people have come here of their own volition um, if you don't take into consent into consideration the political and social forces that have forced them here. Um, but they can make decisions about what they feel safe with too. So there are a wide range of opinions just as there would be there are people who are willing to take risk. We have workers who do a regular radio program, a regular podcast, a regular TV show. And that's a risk that they're willing to take because they want to be able to speak out about the things that they're passionate about. There are other people who have barely left the farm in eight years because it's too scary. So I think letting those individual people make their own individual choices um, by far the best way to decide. Julie, one thing I want to see how you feel about, because the other thing that, that's always occurred to me is less about risk and more about um, asking someone to take their time off, to travel a distance, to be put in front of the public and, and, and be exhibited, you know? Um, and I don't know if, you know, you know, and I would suggest you offer to pay people, you know, <laughs> their time is worth something, um, you know, but that's another consideration for me. And I don't, does that make sense too? I mean, yeah. I don't know a whole lot about the organization, but I can talk a little bit about it. Do you know any? Um, well, Migrant Justice is a social justice organization that's based in Burlington that works to augment the voices of migrant farm workers. And they have, they're, they're wide ranging from um, political action to advocacy and support to recreational activities, they sponsor soccer tournaments, they sponsor workers' rights um, get-togethers, and they do a lot of um, a lot of the initiative for licenses. Now, I don't know how many of you know that um, you don't need to be here with any documentation to be able to get your driver's license. And you can read about it in the book on page. Um, so they, they have spearheaded a lot of those initiatives in the community. What I would add to that is that uh, Migrant Justice is a political organization, right? They do political organizing, and that's not what we do. Uh, we do educational work. Uh, but they're a great resource. Um, and it's a and it's a resource that's really driven by the farm workers, um, and it's it would be worth a call if you're planning an event uh, to the folks at Migrant Justice to check in with them and see if there's anybody in their speakers bureau that might be willing to come 
um, and speak at your event. Yes, sir, could you come up to the mic? I just want to say yeah, one ahead. thing about uh, migrant justice. The, the one program they have is called Milk of Dignity, which is organizes around uh, pressuring stores to buy from the farms that treat their workers correctly in terms of housing and pay conditions. Ben and Jerry's is on board with, my, uh, with Milk with Dignity program through Migrant Justice to uh, only buy from the farms and that's the, an effort of the Milk with Dignity program of okay. Migrant Justice. I can say that much. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, the Milk with Dignity program, you can learn more about it on the Migrant Justice webpage. Uh, they've been doing a lot of organizing around it lately. You've probably seen them out in front of Hannaford's uh, at various shops around the, around the state. Go ahead. Um, and the local hub for migrant justice, if folks want to get involved more um, physically, is at the Root Social Justice Center at the end of Flat Street, if folks want to get connected here. Um, but that's not my question. Um, <laughs> my question is somewhere, I'm sorry, I don't remember which panelist talked about this as sort of a new model for leadership. Um, and I'm sorry, I don't remember which one of you said it, but I was curious about your thoughts on and maybe you don't know who said it. Um, I was curious your thoughts on how you see this project supporting the leadership of the subjects of the comics, both sort of short term and long term. Great. As the resident non-leadership, non-expert on leadership, I, <laughs> I hope it wasn't me uh, who said that. Um, but I think any time Anytime you ask somebody to tell a story about their life, you're asking them to, uh, to select what they think is important and put it in order and present it in some way. Um, so I think that the word author is related to authority. It makes them an authority on their experience, the act of authoring a narrative you know, and putting it into order. Um, and I think for, for a lot of us, we might not even know what our story is until somebody comes to you and says, how's your day going? Or how's your life going? Or why are you doing this thing you've, you're doing for the past 10 years, right? Um, and the act of putting the details together and choosing what to include in your story is an act of authority and it's an act of kind of taking, uh, I don't want to say ownership of it, because I, I think these stories belong to a lot of people who are involved in them, but nudging, nudging our awareness in a certain direction. And, and I think the act of doing that with other people and creating art, artifacts, things that represent that story uh, as a creative process, I think, uh, I guess I'll go back to what I said before. It's like weaving, knitting us all together. Um, and I think that's a big part of leadership, is not striking out alone and getting people to follow you, but weaving things together so that it makes sense to more people, for better or for worse. Uh, so that's what comes to mind from the artistic perspective. That was really good. <laughs> Thank you, that was really good. Um, do we have any more questions? If not, we'll start to wrap it up. We're right at about 8 o'clock. All right, that was a fast hour. Thank you so much. Uh, just a, a couple of things uh, before we do wrap up. Again, thank you to 118 Elliott uh, for putting the exhibit up uh, and for hosting us here. Um, as, as we noted, um, we're gonna be doing a lot of events around El Viaje Mascaro over the next several months. Um, keep an eye on vermonthumanities.org website. Um, as well as our Twitter, our Instagram, our Facebook feeds. Uh, there'll be a concentrated burst of energy for National Arts and Humanities Month, which is October, um, as well as some events uh, in August and September uh, leading up to it. If you wanna make a trip up to Burlington, we're gonna have a big uh, closing celebration of National Arts and Humanities Month with the uh, Los Villalobos brothers uh, performing a concert. Um, with, in partnership with UVM and the Lane series uh, towards the end of that month. Uh, but there'll be a lot of events through the year on the themes of the books. Again, get involved through vermonthumanities.org. Follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. 
Um, and thank you so much to our panelists this evening. Uh, please do stick around a little bit, look at the exhibit if you haven't had a chance to. And um, one more big round of applause for the panelists. Thank you so much. <laughs>